All right, when Chuck sets back down. All right, let's get started. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. You told us to keep an eye on the coffee pot. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5. <laughs> I couldn't pass that up, son. <laughs> All right. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at a couple verses here. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the difference in the body, soul, and spirit. Uh, me and Paul... My brother was talking about this this afternoon. Uh, I don't believe I will ever fully have a, a complete understanding of the differences in the body, soul, and spirit. But I know they're not the same. All right. Amen. God formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Then he became a living soul. So they're not the same. And we've been looking <coughs> here the last few weeks at the uh, body, soul, and spirit. Not so much uh, teaching on how to be able to tell them apart or to s distinguish between them. But we've been looking at the different states uh, of a man in his lost condition before he's born again and then after he's born again. And uh, we haven't been look, leaning to our own understanding on it. We've just been simply looking at what the Bible says about uh, the new birth, uh, the circumcision of the flesh, uh, uh, how God uh, separates you from your flesh when you receive uh, the Holy Spirit uh, through the uh, hearing and trusting and believing the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's Ephesians 1.13 along with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, there's a reason I use those two verses. Uh, that's what it takes to receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the reception, the hearing, trusting and the believing of the gospel of salvation which according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 was the preaching of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and where we got to this morning was up to the differences in a man from his lost condition before he's born again and his saved condition uh, the Bible distinguishes between those two men. It lays it out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It lays out the difference in the first Adam and the second Adam. The first one being the natural man. The second one being the spiritual man. Uh, let's turn there real fast. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, starting in verse uh, 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, or Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. There they are, right there. The natural man, the first Adam. The spiritual man, the second Adam, or Jesus Christ. Adam was made a living soul. Jesus Christ was made a quickening spirit. And then it says the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as is the earthy. Such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, 
such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And then if you go back to Galatians chapter 5, that's where we lead off, lead, lead off with uh, tonight the uh, natural man and the spiritual man. The natural man is lost. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Right? right? The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. It's impossible for the natural man to receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's why when you talk about the Bible with most people, they look at you cross-eyed. Why? Because the natural man cannot <laughs> receive the things of the Spirit of God. Just think about it for a little bit. Think about some of the things that we teach here. And not only we do we teach here, but we put it above that which we see with our physical eyes. Amen. Amen. Yes. I believe more in Jesus Christ and the armies of heaven flying out of the sky on white horses one day and putting an end to the kingdom of the Antichrist Amen. and the armies of this world more than I believe hope and change. Right. Amen. Amen. Me and my brother was talking about this tonight. Go over to Psalms chapter 2. You hear this a lot in the news today. What's that the abbreviation for? Somebody tell me. United Nations. UN. The United Nations. United Nations. Go read Psalm chapter 2 and see what God thinks about that abbreviation right there. This is some of the word God associates with the United Nations. As a matter of fact, a preacher me and my brother like, he has a book he wrote, and he gets to where he's covering the Tower of Babel, and he's got in his notes the birth of the UN. The United Nations. Here's what God says using the words UN. Ungodly. <coughs> Unthankful. Unholy. Yeah. This ain't in there, but you can put it there. Unprepared. Kiss the sun lest he be angry. You think the leaders of this world are prepared to bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and kiss His feet? No way. They're unprepared. That's everything that God thinks about the UN all wrapped up in the, a few descriptions there. And it probably goes a lot farther than that. But if you go read Psalm chapter 2, that's what the chapter is about. The kings of this are taking counsel together. That's what the United Nations is. Amen. That's why you have the United Nations Security Council. They're taking counsel. A bunch of world leaders sitting in a room in a circle trying to decide how best to rob God's people of the land that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. They're unholy. I don't put 25 cents into anything so most of these political leaders today have to say. What do you think uh, our uh, government's uh, trying to take uh, our guns away from us come from? The United Nations. The United Nations. Notice I said try. This thing is a foreign language to most people. Why? They're natural. When Adam sinned in the garden, he lost the image of God. And man's been trying to get it back ever since. But you cannot receive the image of God until you receive Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Because he is the express image of God's person. So which one are you? Natural man, spiritual man? If you're born again, you're the spiritual man. You're born in the image of Jesus Christ. And at that state, after that, the Bible is going to refer to you in one of two ways. You're either behaving like the natural man according to your flesh, which is carnal, meaning you're behaving like the old man, or you're renewed in the spirit of your mind. We've already looked at the scriptures over the last few weeks. Is that not what it said? Yeah. The scriptures that we covered? Amen. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. Put off the old man and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Right? Right. So that's where we're at tonight. So what I'm going to cover tonight, because everybody here is saved, I believe that. Amen. Everybody here tonight is saved. Born again. If you're not, you know how to be. You've received the preaching of the gospel, the death, burial, and res resurrection so much in this church. If you're not saved, it's your own fault. Amen. All you have to do is receive it, trust it, and believe it. Amen. After the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. Right. <clears throat> but here in Galatians chapter 5, Starting in verse 16, the Bible says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is written to believers. Right. Now how are you going to let somebody's flesh make you doubt whether they're saved when Paul's telling a bunch of believers walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh the word walk means to behave in a certain way so behave in the spirit Behave in a way in agreement with the Spirit. Right. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. Each and every moment of each and every day of your whole life is filled with individual actions where you're either behaving in accordance or in agreement with the Spirit or you're walking in accordance with your own flesh. People say, I just don't know what God wants me to do. Why? <laughs> right here it is. I got, you got the same book I have. Why don't you know what God wants you to do? Walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Behave in a way in agreement with the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. <laughs> The only way to keep from fulfilling the lust of the flesh is to behave in a way that's in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then verse 17, he says, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. There's never, ever, 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 going to be a time until you're conformed into the image of Jesus Christ that His appearing that your flesh and spirit if you're saved are going to be in agreement with each other right. never in a believer's life you got one of two circumstances they're either feet in the spirit and the flesh is weak 
or they're feeding the flesh and the spirit's weak. Right. Amen. There's not none of this. You ever hear people say play patty cake with the devil? A Christian can't play patty cake with the devil. You're either giving into the flesh or you're giving into the spirit. All right. That's what he says here. The flesh lusteth against the spirit. Why is that? Why can you not have some kind of straddle the fence life as a born again believer? It's because the flesh is under the law of sin, Romans chapter 7, and always will be until it dies. Right. Amen. There's nothing going to change it. Your flesh is under the law of sin. It's under the controlling influence of sin. The flesh lusteth. For that reason, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. It's not just wanting what's opposite of the Spirit. What the flesh lusts for is in total contradiction to the Spirit. It's against it. Right. And the spirit is totally contrary to the flesh. Or contradictory to the flesh. And these, see there, there he says, these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. The things that you would. Right. Romans chapter 7. Right. For when I would... That which I see. You can't get people to understand this from Romans chapter 7. You turn over and try to show it to them when they're trying to understand what sin is or you're trying to teach them about sin and you turn over to Romans chapter 7 and you tell them stuff like this and they look at you like you've got birds hovering over your head or something. You could have the best of intentions on the face of the earth. When you can't follow through with it, why is that? It's because of the law of sin in your flesh. Right. <coughs> I need to get up at a certain time. I say that every Saturday night when I go to bed. I need to get up early enough in the morning so I can get to church on time. Alarm clock goes off. Snooze. <laughs> Snooze. Now, none of y'all would take me outside the church here and crucify me for that. Well, we do that before you get here. But why? The will, for to will is present with me, but how to do that which is good, I find not. The will is there that I want to and know that I need to, Get out of bed just 15 minutes earlier so I can get here on time. But I can't bring myself to do it. Why? Because my flesh is not under subjection to the law of my mind. Why? It's under subjection to a different law, and that's the law of sin. Then I find a law. You can tell somebody just as simple as, if you're diabetic and you know you shouldn't eat a Krispy Kreme donut, but you do it anyways, it's because of sin. I just don't see it that way. I don't believe that's a sin. <laughs> I didn't say it was a sin. I said you can't keep from eating it because of sin in your flesh. It's called a condition. That mankind's cursed with. So that when I find a law, that when I do when I do good, evil, evil is present with me. Evil's still there. Right. <coughs> flesh and spirit. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit lusts against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other, meaning they're opposed. The flesh and spirit are opposed to each other. 
Whatever the flesh lusts for is opposed to the things of the Spirit. Whatever the Spirit lusts for is opposed to the flesh. And then he says, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. There is no law to a man that's being led by the Spirit. I don't know how to uh, articulate what he's talking about there. Did Jesus Christ say love your enemies? Yeah. He said pray for them, spitefully use you, and persecute you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If the Holy Spirit leads you to do that, you're not under the law. There's no law that tells you how to turn the other cheek. Somebody might do something bad to this man. His method to turn the other cheek is he might take $100 and go give it to him. Somebody might do the same exact thing to that man and he might go shovel their driveway. If ye are led in the Spirit, ye are not under the law. There's no law to those who are led of the Spirit. Right. Do y'all realize how uh, what a bondage it was to be under the law of the Old Testament? Do you know there was a whole tribe of Israel that was devoted to nothing else but carrying out one aspect of that law? The Levitical priesthood. God didn't even give them an inheritance in the land. That's right. He right. said, I'm going to put you over charge of this, my service, and because I am, and it's going to be a full time job serving me, the rest of them is going to take a tenth of everything that they get and give it to you and support you. Amen. 365 days a year, 24 7. The law of God. Just one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But those who are led in the Spirit are not under the law. There is no law to those being led of the Spirit. Now, if <laughs> people want to abuse that and be like, see, we're not under the law. No, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Amen. That don't mean you can just give in to the flesh uh, 23 hours a day, uh, 58 minutes of the last hour and say, well, I'm, under, I'm not under the law. Verses 19 to 21, he says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And let me just say this inherit is not the same word as saved. Right. Inherit is not the same word as enter or see. You enter, you can see the kingdom of God by the new birth. That don't mean you're going to inherit it. We're children of God by being an heir of God. If children, then heirs heirs of God, right? right? And join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, if we live in the Spirit, let us also 
walk in the Spirit. You see the difference? If you're a Christ, you've crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. It's dead in Jesus Christ. It died with Him. It's been buried and it's already resurrected. You're seated with Him in heavenly places. We've covered this time and time again here. But Paul says, <clears throat> if you're Christ, you've crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. But... If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's behave according to the Spirit. Did we not start this out with the word walk? Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, First Peter chapter two. Peter chapter 2. Before we start with verse 1, look back up in chapter 1, verse 23. natural man or the spiritual man? Spiritual. It's a spiritual man. We're talking about somebody that's born again. Chapter 1 verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Amen. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. <coughs> and then he's got some instructions for these people right here. He says, Wherefore, laying aside, this ain't something that God can knock you upside the head and make you do. I've had encounters with people that's been saved 50 years that cannot get rid of these things right here. Why? Because they don't lay them aside. Amen. You choose whether you're going to be malicious or uh, full of guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speakings. You choose those things. What does it mean to have malice? It means you do things just to hurt other people. What does it mean to have guile? Deceit. Yeah, you're deceitful. You come in and you make sure that you, before you came to church you put your Sunday best on. The only time you wear it is on Sundays. Amen. And you think it does something for you. You actually think you're fooling people. That's God. All right. And you choose whether you lay that aside or not. You choose whether you're going to be full of hypocrisy. You choose whether you're going to be envious and full of evil speakings.
And you can't get to verse 2 unless you lay those things aside. Amen. You got to say, I'm not consciously going to be full of malice anymore. I'm not consciously going to be full of guile anymore. What, it, what, what you see is what you get. I'm not going to envy other people. I'm not going to talk bad about other people. Full of evil speakings. <clears throat> I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to have one standard of judgment for one person and hold a completely different standard for myself. Yeah, right. Well, because I did it, it was okay. But you know what so and so down at that other church did? And you got to lay all those things aside first. Then, he says, as. As newborn babes. You know what a babe don't have? You ever seen a baby that was malicious? You ever seen a baby that was uh, deceitful? I'm not talking about, we'll get to those in a minute. I'm not talking about the toddlers and the what the Bible refers to as little children. I'm talking about newborn babes that are just born again, that are newly born. Right. You ever seen one of them malicious? Well, I'm gonna sit in my crib and do this on draw all over myself because I just don't like mommy. <laughs> and I want to hurt her. You ever seen one of them with guile or deceit? Or that was a hypocrite? I'm not talking about in the movie, look who's talking. I'm talking about in the real world. Amen. <laughs> you ever seen one of them that's full of envy and evil speaking? No. Newborn babes have none of those things. So getting rid of those things makes you as newborn babes. And then he says, after you're as a newborn babe, after then you can desire the sincere milk of the word. I've never met a person in my life that had malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, or evil speaking that you could carry on an intelligent conversation with about this book right here. Amen. Why? Because they do not desire the milk of God's Word. They can't. Why? Newborn babes do that. Newborn babes desire the sincere milk of God's Word. He says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Now notice this. I like this part of these verses. And you know why usually people can't get rid of malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking? Because if you get down, right down to the root of the problem, They've never truly tasted how gracious the Lord is. What was it Jesus said about the woman? He said, To those that are forgiven much, they love me more. Those that hunger after this book, want to be fed by this book, get rid of mouse and envy and evil speaking. They're the ones that fit into this verse where it says, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Amen. Why does he keep amen? When God shows you grace, you have a hard time holding other men's sins over their heads and being hypocritical and full of guile and all these things. Forgive ye one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, 
hath forgiven you. Amen. Amen. That's our attitude. Right? I'm going to be done here shortly. I'm not going to get through everything tonight. But Peter talks about laying these things aside so you can desire the sincere milk of the Word. You're not going to desire the sincere milk of the Word until you do lay them aside. Only those who've tasted the Lord is gracious can lay these things aside and be in a state as a newborn babe able to desire the genuine or true milk of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? How do you spot these in the church? How do you spot babes in church? He just told you. Envy, strife. Envy, strife, and division. I don't know if I will ever be able to wrap my head around what happened here February the 7th. And I've expressed this more than once. There is not a word in the English vocabulary. I can tell this church and the people, the women, and the people that came out and worked in my fundraiser, and all the people in this community that came out and supported it and gave me donations, and these church stores around here that donated supplies, and I can say thank you, I appreciate it, all that stuff, until I'm blue in the face. And thank you. I appreciate it. But I don't feel like it's, it's, it suffices for what I know my heart should feel about that situation. There was no envying. There was no strife and division. I let a couple meetings that I had trying to get organized for it get under my skin a little bit but then when I got home I was like oh, I gotta smooth things over with everybody at the church make them know that I wasn't upset about nothing I was just flustered I'm overwhelmed I had a lot going on at that time but I don't feel like there was ever any kind of envy or strife or division in that and, and those things like that split churches it's happened many times. You go to have one little simple fundraiser and you end up with three or four families leaving. That's how you spot a baby in Christ. They're full of envy, strife, division. And that's evidence that they're carnal. Babes are carnal. A baby in Christ is one who lives after the flesh. They're born again, but they haven't begun to war against the flesh. Flesh. Do you see envy? Envy is something Peter told us we had to lay aside. He fed them with milk because they were not able to receive meat because the milk had done them no good. Why? I imagine they refused to lay aside the envy and the strife and division. That's in, that's in everybody's power. Deacon A and Deacon B has argument over what color the carpet's going to be. You tell me they can't just say, okay, 
You can have it whatever color you want it to be. Walk away, tell me that ain't a choice. Oh, I just couldn't help myself. My flesh got the best of me. <laughs> no, you chose to be puffed up yeah. and upset over the color of carpet. When some churches in this world are begging people for money just so they can put a coat of paint on the outside. Babe in Christ is marked by those things. And there's some things we have to get rid of after we get saved before we can ever begin to grow. How much? How long have I been going? I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see nothing on time. I guess we'll find out here in a minute, won't we? <laughs> I'm going to be done right there, but let me uh, just cover a couple quick points. The one I really like to focus on, we have newborn babes or babes that all referred to here. There's a difference in newborn difference in newborn babes and babes. But Paul also covers, he addresses different places in his letters. He addresses children. All these groups have identifying marks found in the scriptures where he mentions right. children. What's the difference in children and babe? A child, a child knows the Father. I'll stand on this the day I die. Salvation is a work of God. Amen. How dare any preacher tell somebody when it's a work of God to start with that if they don't remember a day or time or a specific phrase or prayer that they said or didn't feel a certain amount of guilt, then they didn't really get saved. The only thing they had to do Go back in the book of Acts and look at the group of believers that were sitting there listening and while the preacher was still preaching, the Holy Spirit came down Amen. on them. Amen. They didn't get up. They didn't say yay or nay. They didn't get on any knees. They did nothing. Right. Why? Because salvation is of God. Amen. <coughs> The difference in a babe and a child. Do you remember your mom when you was uh, six months old changing your diapers and giving you a bottle? But you was alive, wasn't you? You was just as alive at four months old as you was at two years. But what was the difference when you was a babe and a child? You became conscious of your mom and dad. Right. That's the difference. Children know the Father. And I'm ashamed to say this. I'm not really ashamed. I mean, God brought me where He's got me to, right? But for the biggest part of my young adulthood was spent trying to figure out if I really knew the Father. <laughs> But there was something in there just kept spinning, and kept spinning, and kept spinning. And look here, look here, look here. Finally, God just said, got me flat on my face and now and then he said, now listen to me. What I have to say about the matter, I said, oh yeah, Father. That's when I, became, that's when I knew God was Father. I became conscious of the fact that I'm Born again. Amen. And then you have uh, young men. You have babes, children, young men. I'm not going to go into any detail on any more of these. We'll get those later. You have young men. They've overcome the wicked one. You have fathers. 
this is the one I really like to focus on. We don't have any of them in the church today, I'll tell you that much. Paul said, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ. Everybody has a doctrine. Everybody has lessons they want to teach. Everybody has theories on the Bible. You have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers, he said. And then he said, for this cause, why? Because they had 10,000 instructors, but not many fathers. He said, I have sent unto you to mafias, that he might put you in remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. Amen. How strange was it when somebody told you the Apostle Paul takes precedence for us today. This will be on YouTube and it will be on Facebook and I don't care who it upsets. In the age that you live in, the Apostle Paul takes precedence. Amen. Why? Because he's the Apostle to the Gentiles. Right. Peter didn't even know everything that Paul knew. How are you going to listen to him? He wrote his letters and didn't even have a full revelation. You're going to get all your doctrine from him? We just quoted 1 Peter here tonight, didn't we? Right. So did we cast Peter out like they try to accuse us of? No. Y'all believe in chopping up the Bible and throwing parts of it away. Did we not go to 1 Peter chapter 2 tonight? Yep. Amen. But you better know how to go to it. But a father will put you in remembrance of Paul's ways. And then you have those that are full of age. Full of age. I tease my dad, and I'm going to close with this. Maybe I'm just from a different generation. People catch me teasing my dad, and they're like, oh, you shouldn't do your dad like that. I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't allowed to tease him. He's so worthy of being teased. <laughs> Thank you. But I respect him. I usually let him do things his way, even if I don't agree with him or think that he's wrong sometimes. <laughs> because I respect him. And he's full of age. <laughs> and I'm going to quit with this story. I gave the boys, my nephews, a basketball goal that I had at my house. And it's one of the ones that, that has a base in it about that big that you either fill with sand or water. How big is something that big around and that thick going to weigh after you fill it up with water? <laughs> now here's the kicker. The thing has a wheel on it where it can be rolled. My yard has a bank in it. So I told Dad, I was like, here's what we need to do. I done thought this thing through for two weeks. <laughs> I said, when you get down to the house, back your truck up to that bank, let your tailgate down, We'll take a two by four, set it up in the bed of your truck, tip that thing over and wheel it up the two by four into the bed of your truck. Him and Paul come down there, no, I know it don't have to be done that way. And I'm gonna prove it. <laughs> Fought with that thing for 30 minutes. I just stood there, I know it was useless. <laughs> Just watched them. How'd you end up getting it in the bed of the truck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I thought we could lift it up.